Hey, Vid, how are you? Thank you so much for coming on uh, the podcast and congratulations for putting out um, A Man of Two Faces, your your most recent memoir. Hi, Ken. Glad to be here and talking about it with you. I uh, I, I want to start off with a very simple uh, question. I have a, a lot of grown friends, grown adults, highly educated, and they ask me all the time, what's the difference between a memoir and autobiography? I feel like we all should know this, right? But I'm here to discuss your your new memoir, Man of Two Faces, and I'd love to hear you put on the uh, professorial hat and explain to the rest of us wh- why did you choose to go down the memoir route, and what what's the difference ultimately between um, an autobiography and a memoir? I think it's a pretty thin line, but you know I think an autobiography tends to be more of the complete life from beginning to end. Uh, you know, you're, you're probably really almost dead by the time you write one of these things or your your career, whatever made you famous is probably over. Um, memoirs, I think, are more a little more flexible. I mean, you could be a teenager and write a memoir, for example. So I think memoirs are not so much based on the entirety of a life, but on some particular theme or incident or whatever it is that traumatized you to make you feel like you should be writing about your life. And what made you want to write about your life at this specific time? I think that I uh, hadn't really set out to write a memoir and set out to write a nonfiction book um, dealing with, you know, what it means to be an American, Asian American, Vietnamese refugee, all these identities that have been important to me. But in order for me to talk about all those things, in fact, I had to go into some very personal spaces because I think that uh, that my shaping as a, as an American, but also my shaping as a Vietnamese person has been deeply influenced by my family, my refugee experience, and all those things are, you know, inextricable from uh, American history. So all these things just happen to to converge. And you know, my mother passed away in in uh, twenty eighteen. So that was that that made it possible to write. A memoir, uh, because there are family secrets being discussed and betrayed here. I don't think I could have done it while she was alive. So you you didn't set out to write a memoir. You set out to write some family history, and it shapes itself along the way. Yeah, I, I think that you know the the I shouldn't even set out to write a family history. I set out again to write about America, the country that you know we are both a part of. And it's obviously a very personal and political uh, subject for me. And if you read the the memoir, A Man of Two Faces, I certainly subject the United States to a whole lot of criticism that is uncomfortable for for certain readers. And, you know, part of the trick of writing one of these kinds of books, I think, is that if you're willing and able to subject somebody else, in this case, a country or a culture to intense criticism, you should be able to do it to yourself as well. And in fact, I think maybe there's more of an acceptability uh, for readers if they can see that the writer is willing to eviscerate himself as well as eviscerate somebody else. And so that's why writing a memoir is really tough because there's no point writing a memoir unless you're willing to to be extremely vulnerable and to be extremely self-critical also. Is that how anything to do with the voice uh the is it called the third person voice that you that you've taken does that have anything to do with it well i mean the, the memoir which is it's it begins and ends in the first person i you know that's typically how memoirs and autobiographies are written but very soon after the book begins i slip into the second person you mm-hmm. uh, and that dominates the book for about two-thirds of the way through and and the reason why I did that was because, again, my initial resistance to writing a memoir, which is partly about the fact that I always felt that my life was not very interesting to write about. You know, I think that uh, we look at our, I look at my own life and I find it to be very mundane. Not like my parents, for example, and, you know, you know, this kind of a story of the Vietnamese refugees of the earlier generations, everything they went through for their, you know, decades and decades of their life in Vietnam and and then uh, coming here to the United States. That those are really dramatic and powerful stories. And I start off the book by saying, I think all of our parents should have, th- those of us who are Vietnamese refugees, all of our parents should have movies made out of their lives. The children, maybe not so much, but I had to, to, to you know, ag- understand that, in fact, I think the refugee experience did do some significant damage to me and shaped me in some very fundamental fundamental ways. 
that I wanted to understand. Um, and that I think in trying to understand myself, I could also understand my family better, the Vietnamese refugee experience better, and the United States better. But in order to do that, I had to get a little distance from myself because I think I was so close to myself, as many of us are, that I that I could not see what was interesting or what was problematic about me. And so the second person writing about myself as you allowed me to have a conversation with myself and, and analyze myself. When did you find out that um, you aren't that interesting? Or when did you decide that that was like a thing? People told me, you're not interesting. <laughs> it's like, it's like, I was never somebody that, you know, other people thought was particularly unique or anything like that. And, and um, you know, all, all the accomplishments that I've had and whatever, I think they were pretty normal kinds of accomplishments for middle class, upper middle class kind of person. I don't think there was anything really that unique about me. Um, I think what I started to understand, however, was that when I became a writer, and I've been, you know, talking in the book about how I spent three decades of misery in trying to become a writer. But by the end of those three decades, when I finally felt that I had understood what writing involved and therefore I could call myself a writer. At that point, I also understood that to be a writer is not only a question of art uh, and technique, but it's also a question of emotions, of you know, being able to find emotions within myself that were really powerful and, and potentially very unnerving and unsettling and putting that into the characters and the stories that I write. And once I was able to do that, then I understood that there was something deep inside of me that uh, was interesting, um, certainly to myself, maybe to others as well. Um, Kissinger uh, died yesterday. Um, and from all accounts, I mean, this is a war criminal, um, the way so many of us see it. And um, he devastated many, many lives. And we're seeing the same similar power dynamics kill innocents in Gaza today. Uh, and this feels to me like an eternal cycle. And it's made me difficult to to enjoy anything. My birthday just recently, uh, Thanksgiving. I, I can't operate like a regular human being. Nothing makes sense to me since October 7th. This is continuing to go on, even in the, the face of a live stream, uh, basically near live coverage. When... Do you think any of this is going to slow down for humanity? Oh, well, the pessimist in me says not for quite a long time. The optimist in me says not a long time could be hundreds of years, which on the human scale, even on the human scale, is not that long. You know, we've been around for, for quite a while. And so I take hope in the sense that 10,000 years ago, we were slaughtering slaughtering each other in because we came from different villages. And now it's so, you know, different nations some, most of the time. Um, that's progress, I think. <laughs> uh, but of course, where that progress meets a hard limit is that we've also developed the technology so that it's no longer just swords and killing people in the next village. We have nuclear weapons that can wipe out the other country, but also everyone as well. And I think that's that's one of the things that Kissinger represents is, you know, one of the reasons why he was so disturbing uh, is because he had so much power at his at his command. Like this one person and the influence that he wielded over many years meant that he could dictate or shape the fates of countries and the lives and deaths of millions of people. And that's deeply disturbing. But when we call him or some of us call him a war criminal, I think what we're trying to get people to understand is that there's a very thin line between what is legal and what is criminal at the level of how nation states exercise politics. And basically the only line is that nation states do whatever they wanna do and whatever they can get away with. So the United States will tell other countries, you can't do this because it doesn't follow international law, but we will do whatever we want because we're America. But you know, most countries would probably do the same thing if they had that same degree of power. I think that that's what Kissinger demonstrated, what he was, what he was, what was so disturbing about him because he made it nakedly apparent that this is at the heart of statecraft power. Whoever dictates it, whoever controls it, they can determine legality and illegality. Uh, and it was particularly galling because he's American and he's an immigrant and he's Jewish. You're not supposed to do these things according to our mythologies if you're any of these kinds of categories. But he demonstrated that these types of people could do these kinds of things, even if terrible things have been done to them, or even if in the case of the United States, we're supposed to be better than those things. Right. So I think that's what Kissinger demonstrates. And I think that's what the, the situation in Gaza with Israel demonstrates as well. What gives you the the strength and, and the power to, to face headwinds that to go 
against the grain and speak up. Where do you find the strength to to really just speak up? You know, I think there's something in me that's naturally polemical. I, I, I've, I've shot my mouth off since I was in college at the very least. But if, if I try to understand the roots of where this polemical impulse comes from, this this sense that if anyone tells me I shouldn't say something, I shouldn't do something, my my response is, I'm going to say it. I'm going to do it. If you're telling me this is a taboo, then why? And if I don't agree, I'm going to try to uh, you know violate that taboo. I think that where it comes from, going back to analyzing myself, is it comes from my parents. It comes from the fact that they were not political people or polemical or anything like that. But what I watched, what I saw growing up with them was that they were very sacrificial people. I mean, they were devout Catholics. And I came out an atheist despite all of that. But what I absorbed from the Catholic experience, especially the Vietnamese Catholic experience, is the importance of sacrifice. You know, we share this with communists, ironically. Vietnamese Catholics and Vietnamese communists, I think, are mirror images of each other. They believe in different things, but at the core, they believe in sacrifice, they believe in revolution, they believe in redemption, they believe in an afterlife, all these things. And they believe in dying for their cause. Let's hope it doesn't get that far. But, you know, I, I think that that's what I that's what I got from my parents, that this they had this uh, complete sense of justice. They didn't extend it to like politics, but that sense of justice that comes about from knowing that they're right, and that they're going to devote themselves to what they believe in, I think that's what I absorbed. And watching everything that my parents went through, I think I I I, I got the sense that nothing that would happen to me uh, would be comparable to what it is that happened to them. And I think that's what gives me strength, um, the sense that if my humble parents could do what they did without recognition or reward outside of the financial and the love they got from their children and grandchildren, um, then I could do the least I could do um, is speak up. But they didn't speak up on any issues. They didn't have to, right? They didn't go through this sort of um, uh, a fight uh, with the outside world after they got to the U.S. That wasn't their problem. You know, their problem was just trying to survive and take care of themselves and their children and their families. And that's heroic enough, as I think all of us know who witness our parents go through these kinds of things. In my case, I don't have, that's what I mean when I said, I didn't have anything, I didn't sense that my life was dramatic because what was going to happen to me? I was going to go to high school, go to college, get a degree, get a job. These were accomplishments, but, you know, anybody could do that. Uh, but how many people could survive the refugee and wartime experiences yeah. of our parents? And so I'm not impressed by myself. I'm not impressed by what I've been able to accomplish. And so I feel that, again, this act, the, the one capacity, the one talent I have is to write and, and through writing to speak up. And that's where, for me, then, the courage, I guess, if you want to call it that. I don't I don't find it courageous, but the, the, the necessity and the will to take a stance by doing the one thing I can do based on the one thing that my parents could do, which was to work and to sacrifice, that's what gives me motivation. Now, now in the back of your mind's eye, are you writing on a whiteboard mentally the calculus of the outcomes of what you're going to say to the world? Or are you just, is there something internally guiding you and saying, fuck everything else. I'm just going to put out this internal like straight line and wherever the pieces fall, they fall. I think it's a negotiation. I mean, certainly what we're, what we're witnessing now with Gaza and Israel, for example, as you said, is that people are feeling pressured not to say certain things and certain words like, you know, so suddenly it's, 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 impossible or discouraged to say the words genocide or apartheid in regards to Israeli policies towards Palestinians in Gaza. Um, now, whether or not you agree with those, term, those terms, I mean, why, why do people feel that these words are suddenly taboo, that it's actually a hate crime or anti-Semitic to say these words? I mean, that's a real pressure on people. And I acknowledge that sometimes I hesitate before saying things like that. But at the same time, I, I, I think that for me, those terms are actually pretty accurate um, in terms of what's happening, at least from my perspective. And if you disagree, we can argue about it. But to simply censor and self-censor, this is deeply problematic territory. And as a writer, I think I have to push back against that. And so sometimes I do calculate the consequences. And if I feel like uh, a particular Instagram post or, or or something like that will, will be more friction than I want to handle at 12 o'clock at night, I won't. But on the more important things, like uh, signing a letter, um, along with 750 other writers, 
asking for a ceasefire. That was that I, I thought about that for 30 seconds before I signed that letter. And that was the letter that got me canceled. You know, so uh, uh I, I didn't think that was gonna happen, but in retrospect, even if I did know that was gonna happen, I would still sign that letter. What about in the classroom? Um do you talk much about this? Do the students come up and 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 you know raise their hand and and ask you to engage much on this topic? Well, this hasn't come up in class, but um, I will say that I think the, the role of a teacher, from my perspective, is not to tell students what to think. I think that's actually self-defeating, especially on, on, on an issue as divisive as, as Israel and, and Palestine. To tell people what to think is, is, is self-defeating. You have to, with as with everybody else, with students, I think my task is to give them information, to give them perspectives, to give them theories and frameworks, and then they can make up their own mind. And the concrete example from my own experience is that I teach a class on the American war in Vietnam to 150 students. That class is now a military history requirement at USC or fulfills a military history requirement. I've always had military students in this class, but since it became a requirement, I have even more. I have like dozens, I think, in any given class uh, of young people, men and women, you know, training in the various branches, and they're going to go off and serve, and, and probably some of them will be in combat and so on, as I know happened in the past. And in the past, when we were in the middle of the, the, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, I'd have people coming back from those wars becoming cadets at USC, and they had real war experience. And here I was talking about war with people who had been through war or were preparing to go through war. Uh, that was an incentive for me to think that, in, in fact, speaking about that kind of an issue of war with with the military was actually really important. But my task there was not to, again, shout at them to tell them whatever I believe in, but my task was to tell them a story about the, the war in Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia and put something in their heads. I don't know what I put in their heads, but maybe someday when my, my, when my, when my former students are flying F-18s, as I know some of them do or did, they'll think about this or they'll think about it afterwards, you know? And that's the kind of change I would hope to make. And, but you're not getting any sort of engagement in right now, present moment in your classes um, about what's going on in Gaza? Well, uh, well, I'm not teaching right now. There's that. Um, however, I, on Tuesday, I'm, I'm going to be, this might be after the this episode airs, but on Tuesday, I'll be delivering a lecture at Harvard, the third out of six Norton lectures that I'm giving. And I did not plan for this lecture to touch on Palestine and Israel when I came up with the title in July. But I will talk about Palestine and Israel on Tuesday in relationship to Asian Americans. Um, I don't know how that lecture is going to go, uh, but I felt that, in fact, uh, it was important to, to do this, not just out of some simple desire to talk about Asian Americans because I'm Asian American and Israel and Palestine. But in fact, because the whole point of the lecture is to say we're all Asians. What does that even mean? You know, if you look at this vast continent of Asia, it's huge. It's a third, it's the largest continent in the world. You know, Vietnam is on one end of it. And on the other end is Israel, literally on the other end is Israel and Palestine. And technically it's all Asia. What does that even mean? You know, I mean, we, we, I, we would not expect Israelis and Palestinians to call themselves Asians, or if they came here to call themselves Asian Americans. Right. In fact, the logic of how becoming an Asian American works in this country has always been about people who never thought of themselves as Asian until they got to the United States and received anti-Asian racism and violence, and then started to make connections between that and what happened to them in Asia under uh uh, European or American colonialism or intervention. So that's that's where the lecture is going to go, you know, and people may not like it. Hey, what made you think about this back in July? And now it's so relevant, but what, what got you to submit that? Well, the lecture title is on the deaths of Asian Americans. So I was going to talk about anti-Asian violence here in the United States and how it shapes our literature and culture and so on. Um, and then, of course, Gaza, uh, the invasion of Gaza happened, and I started to, to go back to this idea that, I, that you know, some of us have thought about for a while, which is that we are Asian Americans and not Orientals. You know, that's how we become politicized in this country, by rejecting the stereotype of the Oriental and all, of, all that it represents. But if you go and read Edward Said's book, Orientalism, which is what gave a lot of us this intellectual framework to talk about Orientals, He's not talking about Vietnamese people and Japanese and Chinese and East Asians and Southeast Asians. He's talking about 
what was then called the Near East and the Far East, I mean, the Near East and the Middle East. Uh, he's, he's talking about Arabs and Muslims. Those were the Orientals he was concerned with under British and French colonialism. We in the United States are, are Asian Americans, Orientals under American intervention and colonialism. So is there a connection between those two? And I think there is. You know, I think that, again, these are very different situations that we're describing, I'm describing here, but the kinds of violence that that uh, Palestinians are subjected to and feel that they're subjected to, um, I think is a, a part of the same apparatus of violence that we as Vietnamese people were subjected to by the United States. That's how I make the connection between where we started with talking about Kissinger to the present moment, because in fact, they're related. <laughs> I think, you know, I think there are certain people in certain states that admire Kissinger for what he did. Right. And and so that 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 there's a dividing line there between those who think Kissinger did the right thing as flawed as what he might have done. And those of us who think, no, that's a war criminal in operation. And I think that's the same line that is now dividing us around the question of Israel, Palestine and Gaza. With that, with what you just said, um, a question that I that I face in my private conversations with a lot of people uh, that they ask me back is, on October 7th, what would have been appropriate for Israel to do? I don't have a good answer for that. I don't think I'm there. I don't think I have the investments, obviously, that the people who live in Israel and Palestine do. Um, I think that whatever Israel should have done or might have done, what it's doing now is wrong. I think it's counter. Besides the fact that it's killing thousands and thousands of innocent Gazans, uh, Palestinians, um, I just don't think it's going to work for Israel. I don't think it's going to stop Hamas. I don't think it's going to quench the spirit of Palestinian uh, rebellion and desire for a homeland. I don't think it's going to make Israel safer. And so none of the, and, and in fact, and, and I think it erodes Israel's already damaged image globally. Maybe yeah. not among American politicians uh, who are, you know, major sponsors of Israel, but globally, yes, I think it's, 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 very bad for Israel's image. So that that is a political consequence that Israel will have to contend with. So again, whatever Israel might have done or could have done, what it is doing, I deeply disagree with. And I think it's too too far and too late to return back to anything now with that north northern area of Gaza completely destroyed. And they're basically probably just going to go back in and rebuild. And then now we, as people who are looking into history and contending with this is gone like that way of life for people in gaza in that area is no longer there and this is what makes me really sad um when i think about things and, and what makes me cripple uh in, in in my even daily life now is to think that in this modern era how many people can be displaced like that and permanently displaced like that and there are agendas to move them outside of that area permanently it is no is there no recourses there's no things that the world can do to stop this sort of really the the destruction of human lives like this well i think that bothers a lot of us um i mean the situation you're describing uh I would describe as ethnic cleansing. Um, people have been bombed out of their homes. I don't think that is collateral damage. I think that is the actual point of what's happening. Um, whatever whatever Israel does to Hamas, I think I think the point is to punish Palestinians. Um, and uh, I don't know. I don't like you said. I don't think I don't know if, it, if if northern Gaza can be rebuilt. I don't know if Palestinians will be allowed to come back. Um, that's all determined by Israel at the moment. So we obviously have not been able to stop it, although arguably global protests might have shaped the possibility of a ceasefire or a pause. It doesn't give me a lot of hope, but it does give me the sense that we're not, those of us who are not involved directly are not completely powerless. Um, in fact, as minuscule as speaking up might be, that is an act of power, just as censorship and suppression are acts of power, which is why you know the, the, the situation that you've described in terms of people feeling silenced here, that actually means something. 
because if speaking up didn't mean anything, if it if speaking up actually if if speaking up somehow did not have any impact on what was going on, then why are these efforts to speak out being suppressed before they can even happen? And why are people scared to say anything? It's power. So we ourselves as individuals in the United States, for example, may not have a tremendous degree of power individually, but collectively, I think there, I find some hope in the sense that if, if enough people did speak out and find courage from each other, that's solidarity, we actually could make some kind of an impact, and which is why, you know, the Israeli government and its supporters have been so intent for years now to suppress not just violent resistance, but to suppress nonviolent resistance and nonviolent speech anywhere in regards to Israel and its efforts in uh, in Palestine and Gaza. So I would say we can, in fact, actually do something. And the fact that we're scared of doing something means that there's actually real power there. I thank you for basically engaging in this conversation with me. Um, it, it does uh, lift a little bit of blows a little pressure off and uh you know it's things that i've been obsessed with for for many many weeks now and speaking about it does feel better um even though we're even though i can't really do anything but just to know that there's somebody who is able to to walk us through this thinking uh of what's going on and making sense of all this uh really helps i'm glad <laughs> and that's the point of speaking out right is to the sense that you know we're not alone whereas if we don't then we do feel isolated and as you say glued to watching these horrifying images with while feeling completely impotent about it recently you spoke in san jose on your book tour and um it was across the street from saigon mai which is the vietnamese supermarket that your parents uh started uh, and you worked at when you were growing up when you were there working and being there as a, a, a child do you think that there was any time um that you have any particular fantasies for the future of your life that you may be able to share um if you if you thought about your life and your future and your work uh, as you were doing homework there at the supermarket and you know is, is there things that were going through your mind at the time Oh, I was, you know, very young. Um, my parents ran that grocery store from 1978 to 1988 or so, uh, 10 years, very hard 10 years. Um, and I think the only fantasies I had as the pressures accumulated over that decade with my parents and, and what they were undergoing, the only, the only fantasies I really had were, number one, get the hell out of San Jose, which I did the moment I was able uh, when I graduated from high school. And then number two, to become a writer. Um, now, what that meant, I had no idea. You know, I, I had these vague I thoughts that, you know, New York was the place to be because even in the San Jose Public Library, a lot of the children's literature that I was reading was based in Manhattan. And I thought, wow, that, that looks really fantastic. Um, but to be a writer, I had no idea what that actually entailed. It was just, it was just, it was just something that I wanted because I think I, I understood that I wanted beauty literature stories represented beauty to me and the Saigon Mai was not beautiful. The Vietnamese refugee experience was not beautiful, but somehow through stories, beauty could save me. And maybe through beauty, I could save my parents, our experiences, our memories, those of Vietnamese refugees as a whole. And what about when you were standing from that vantage point, looking back out, did you have any thoughts or was, it, or was the evening so busy that you really didn't think about it? I'd been there before. Um, what happened was, uh, you know, in um, in the, um, the er, early two thousands or end of the twenty first century, end of the twentieth century, the city of San Jose forced my parents and uh, and several other Vietnamese business owners to to sell their property in downtown San Jose be, through eminent domain because the city had these ambitious redevelopment plans, which led to the city building a brand new city hall across the street from the Saigon Mai and then raising the Saigon Mai with plans to build a symphony hall there, which the city never did and instead sold the property to a developer who built this gigantic apartment complex uh, there. Um, and I was so angry about that, that mm -hmm. for many years, I would never go back to downtown San Jose. I didn't go back until about 2016 when my first novel, The Sympathizer, won the Pulitzer Prize. And you know, then the city of San Jose became 
kind of proud and invited me to City Hall to give me an award. And um, so I went and that was the first time I had been there since uh, since my parents had been forced to sell their property. And I I already I I was there at the at the City Hall looking across the street at where the Saigon Mill used to be. And so at that time, I already started to get the sense that this was in a in some odd way, I had fulfilled my fantasy. I'd become a writer successful enough to be feted at San Jose City Hall, the city, the city I hated so much I had to leave right away. So I I I achieved that goal, I guess, um, that I that was so that I was so inarticulate about. Um, but on the second visit on this book tour and looking out at at the this gigantic apartment complex that had now replaced. Um, the Saigon Mai, I, I think that uh, what I understood was that it wasn't about me. You know, um, it's never been about me. Writing is about me. Writing, art is my individual passion and all of that. But I feel that I'm a part of this much larger collective effort to tell our stories. And that that stop at the San Jose City Hall was organized by an organization that I'd helped to build, Diaspora Vietnamese Artist Network. And so it's about all of us being able to mark the occasion of how much Vietnamese Americans have been able to tell their story in this country. And, and that there was related to what happened to the previous generation. You know, I, I find my parents' experiences to be unique and powerful, but I also find them to be sort of symbolic of what happened to Vietnamese people in general of their generation. You know, they sacrificed themselves for my generation, our generation. And, uh, you know, they they had successes that led to them being erased, right? My parents and all these other Vietnamese shopkeepers had opened these businesses in downtown San Jose when no one else wanted to be there. They helped to gentrify it and they were so successful that the city gentrified them and erased them. This is the cycle of, of America, right? And so we're all in that cycle. And for me as a writer, um, I've benefited from that cycle. I mean, I wouldn't be a writer if my parents hadn't done these things. And I wouldn't be come, brought back to City Hall if, if San Jose hadn't redeveloped this area and all that kind of stuff. So I just felt that um, the book, the memoir, A Man of Two Faces, is about me, but it's also about all these things that make us um, refugees, immigrants, Americans in this cycle of of capitalism that's always been dependent upon people like us. You, your writing and, and the way you think, it's always... A man of two faces. It's always two identities, whether it's the sympathizer or the, or the recent memoir. Do you ever take a single position sometimes about identity? Like, I am an American, here's why I'm an American, or I am Vietnamese and here, or is that unnecessary uh, to, to, to go through life uh, taking a position, one position? We should always keep it dual facing. We should always think about the dual identity that we have i think so i mean I, I i'm trying to think of an identity where for me personally it would be something simple um without that duality or even more layers uh, on top of that and i really i really can't think of anything even the identities that bring me the most pleasure being a writer being a father i think even those identities are, are complicated in, in in different ways you know um, so I think if we really think about it, I don't. I, I, you tell me whether you think there's some kind of uncomplicated position that we could all occupy. Well, uh, I with. ask that because I think often about masculinity, being an Asian man. There's there's a beauty to Vietnamese softness in the men, in 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 our, but there's also this sort of like patriarchal hardness that's that I wanted to ask you about. Uh, after this after this duality that I was going to get into, but fuck it, we're here. And I think about like your father and I think about you and I think about um, so many Vietnamese men after the war uh, getting to America. My father just lost his way. Uh, you know, he's one of these big guys in Vietnam and his his brothers were big guys. And, and they hold on to this. They held on to this uh, way of being. But when they got here, my mom was the one that made the money. And I noticed that many women of my mother's generation were the ones who actually were the business people. They were the real entrepreneurs, not the men. The men just kind of like followed the women's tra track, but they didn't do it well. They just, you know, they just scurried behind the women and, and did their best. But for some reason, they were just not quite all there after the war. And, and I feel like the, the, 
you know, looking at your father, I want to ask about that, you know, um, living in the two kind of like a world of, of being a masculine American man and then a Vietnamese and, and the masculinity is just really jumbled all the time for me. Yeah, no, I, I, I get it, you know, and, and I feel lucky that I have the father that I do. Um, I think the, 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 the more problematic masculinity that you describe, whether it's Vietnamese masculinity or let's say toxic Western American masculinity, um, I, I was, that was exposed. I was exposed to that outside of my house. You know, I, 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 I know some of the kinds of men that you're Vietnamese men you're describing outside of my, my, my house that I grew up in. And growing up as an American boy, I was certainly exposed to all kinds of American versions of masculinity that are kind of deeply problematic. But inside the house, you know, my father was actually um, uh, a, a pretty progressive man. You know, he was willing to do, uh, he co-ran the Saigon Mall and other businesses with my mom. And then when he came home, he would he would do the cooking, help, help the cooking. He would help with the cleaning. He would help with the shopping. And so they were really partners. And so even though there was, kind of that sense obviously that there are men and women and that men are better than women in the Vietnamese context in my own household I didn't really see that hmm. as much. I saw a partnership and I think to me that helped provide me with a little bit of of a reserve against the more toxic versions of masculinity that I that I did absorb um and has hopefully made me <laughs> as I got older better able to detect yeah. that toxic masculinity and try to, to work against it. But yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's, it, this is also a, a set of identities that I, that I think is not, that is not unproblematic. You know, I mean, we draw strength from masculinity. We, we, I mean, I've seen certainly many examples of supportive relationships between Vietnamese men, for example, and Vietnamese young men that were very empowering because it gave a sense of brotherhood, which helped to sustain them through all kinds of, you know, different ages of their lives and different challenges. And yet it was also very, you know, for a lot of them, I think, uh, a way for for them to keep women out. And I was never into it. Like whenever, you know, you know, you go to a Vietnamese party, like the men are in one place and the women are in the kitchen. I never wanted to hang out with the men. I was like, this is, well, why? This is, I, 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 I didn't necessarily want to hang out with the women either, but I was like, why, do we, why are we so gender segregated like that? So I was already resistant from, from an early age towards this kind of gender division that Vietnamese masculinity is wrapped up in. Yeah, I, I, w I was never able to escape it. it. It was entrenched in me and I've been called out for it in the last 10 years of my life. And <laughs> I'm working very hard to reverse that. I believe it, it, it it, it was inside of me that women should be hanging out, not in the kitchen, but in their in their group and, and the men are hanging out. But it comes down, it comes from a Confucian Nam Nu, uh, you know, that male and female should not be uh into so when I'm at a party, I it's ingrained in the back of my mind not to hang out with my buddy's wife because something is gonna happen. Some Hanky panky is going to go down, and I'm going to want to sleep with, and, and and it's something that my mother embedded in me, <laughs> and and so I have now uh, am am making an effort when I go to the parties to go inside and where find where the women are and hang out and just be amongst them and 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 you know many of them say we don't bite you're you're not going to get in trouble my husband's not going to like call you out for being here. And and it's something that I have to purge, uh, and and it's a part of masculinity that um, my generation, uh, you know, I feel like if you're hanging out with Vietnamese culture, it's a problem that that's still there. Probably, I'm, I remember very distinctly when I was maybe twelve years old, and I was, you know, pretty good friends with my female cousin. We got, we went to church together, the two families, and we sat next to each other, and we were just having fun. Well, you shouldn't have fun in church. That was problematic. But number two, I guess a boy and a girl at that age should not be having fun with each other any time. So afterwards, my 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 uh so it's complicated, but her father, who was my cousin, and you know, although he was much older, her father was like, No, you guys can't do this. You guys cannot sit together anymore. Um, and and number one, talk in church, but also we I got the distinct sense this was wrong, not just because we're having fun, but because it was flirtatious, which I didn't understand at all. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think I developed sort of an early resistance to that, but 
unlike you, I was called out much earlier in my life in college, you know, and and not in the Vietnamese context, but in the Asian American political context by Asian American feminists. And I and I never forgot that. But it would take me, you know, a couple of decades to try to work through my own problems of patriarchy and and masculine assumptions and everything like that. Not I'm not patting myself on the back. I think we should all be doing it, but I'm just saying it it takes time to understand the psychology of of toxicity and patriarchy, masculinity that embeds itself. It's not that masculinity in and of itself is wrong. It's when masculinity intersects with all these other things, including power and uh, separation, that I think it becomes deeply problematic. And we all have work to do. I'm not excusing myself in terms of, you know, figuring out how deeply we've imbibed um, problematic masculinity and how, how it might be possible to purge ourselves of that. When we read the the book uh, version of of your memoir, the words are placed a certain way throughout the the writing, and um, there is an intention on how you lay these words out that uh, that I want to ask you about. Uh, was that something that you had thought about um, as you were writing? Um, did this develop? Uh, hey, I'm going to lay out the the typeface this way and and place the words this way. Or was that a gradual sort of uh, thing that just naturally organically just popped up as, as you were working on this? So I've written a, a lot of essays uh, from which the book is drawn and they were all sort of conventionally written. Um, and every time I wrote one of those essays, I was like, for example, writing for the New York Times, wrote a bunch of, of essays for the New York Times. It's, it's a highly constrained form and you get a thousand or 1500 words and you have to have paragraphs and all that kind of thing. And I was always, I understood that was a form I had to use if I wanted to be published in a venue like the New York Times, but it was very constraining. So by the time it came around to writing this memoir, it was enormously liberating because no one was going to tell me what to do. And so, no, it, it came, the the, the 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 play with words and layout that you described came from writing the book, came from the sense of freedom that I had in uh, in writing for myself, which is what I also did when I was writing The Sympathizer. I wrote it for myself. And... You know, I was also drawing from the fact that over the past several years, I'd been writing on Twitter, for example, and Twitter allows you to also, you know, do whatever you want within 140 characters, or whatever it was at the time. And I was reading children's literature with my son and with children's literature. There are no rules. Children will let you get away with anything as long as you entertain them. Adults are much more problematic in a lot of ways, you know, because we think we know how things are supposed to look. And if things deviate, we get kind of upset. I mean, that's actually kind of weird that somehow children have more freedom than we do. Um, and so writing the book was a was a was again my 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 giving in to these impulses for freedom and for the childlike joy that kids have in a great story where there are no uh, boundaries to what they can imagine and what they can do. And so I, a, I as serious as as the book is, as you know, I talk about how I deal with very serious things, it's also I think very playful. Uh, and that's that was very important for me because I wanted it to, to be fun writing this book. And if it was fun for me writing this book, it'd also be fun for readers to read this book, even as occasionally they are reminded of some reminded of some very serious things. Yeah, yeah, it it really comes across as playful. Um, and because it comes off as playful, I it's like I'm looking at a, a crossroad crossword puzzle, and I'm 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 like figuring out. Well, wonder what your process is in laying out. The shapes the way they are and i wanted to ask you is there a process that you went through uh every time you had to lay something out on a page yeah the process what well, process was looks good feels good <laughs> that's, that's really <laughs> literally it um and so again a lot of freedom with that and a lot of intuition and i think that was important for me because for most of my life uh i've been a very rational person i think that's how i survived the refugee experience and everything and all the emotional turmoil that comes out of being a refugee was to be very rational and contain myself and my emotions and be in control all the time. And that's also how I became successful as, as an academic, as a professor uh, with this. But becoming a writer was much more about a process of, of also learning about my emotions and about my intuition and, and learning to trust my emotions and my intuition. And that is, I think, important for creativity, also probably important for us as human beings and as men to get in touch with our feelings and to and to trust those feelings. Yeah. Um, you shouldn't trust those feelings if they're ugly, horrible feelings, right? I mean, that's 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 toxic masculinity. So you have to develop your feelings in a way that's not toxic, and then you can trust those feelings. Um, 
Yeah, so that was that was really, I mean, the the writing of the book as playful was inseparable from me uh, learning how to cope with myself uh, emotionally and learning how to trust myself. Uh, we we talked about the difference between autobiography and memoir in the beginning, and you know, uh, there's multiple memoirs in all of us, right? Um, is there something in the writing of this memoir? Um, I'm, I'm sure in research we learn a, a lot of cool things, but is there things that you didn't know kind of like on a thematic level about how you thought about life that came up um, after writing this memoir? I think that I, you know, thought more about being a father uh, in writing this memoir and I thought more about being a son and being a father. Um, you know, I think that uh, for most of my life, I'd been so utterly focused on myself getting ahead, doing whatever I needed to do for my career and, and my art and all that. I never really thought a whole lot about my parents and about what it meant for them to be parents and what it meant for me to be their son. Um, so this memoir was really an occasion for me to think much more, much more deeply about that. And partly the reason why uh, I wanted to do that was because I became a father and had a son. And as he grew up, I could I, I I would see myself at that age in him when he was four. What was I like at four when some very traumatic things happened to my family and to me? And so uh, that was that was a set of themes, parenting, fatherhood, being a son that I didn't know how deeply I would get into as I started writing the book. Um, and in fact, my partner Lan, you know, read the, the 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 final draft of the book, and she said, "Well, I think you should talk about your children and your family in here." Because I hadn't, I talked about my parents, but I didn't really talk about me being a father and my kids. And so the second to last chapter, which is only like a three page chapter, was a, was the last thing I wrote, I think, in the book, and it is about my children and me and 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 Lan as well. And after you finished it. Did you think that there are perhaps other future potential memoir themes for you? Uh, I think I mentioned early in the inter in our discussion, Ken, that uh, writing a memoir is something that usually comes out of a traumatic, difficult experience, which is why I don't wish it upon anyone that they feel the urge to write a memoir. I think that if I were, I don't want to write another memoir, but if I ever were to write one, it would probably be about my adopted sister who, you know, was 16 when she was left behind uh, in Vietnam in 1975 um, to guard the family property after the communist army captured our hometown. And my, my mother fled with my, my brother and me thinking we'd return someday, but we, we didn't, or at least my parents would not return for about 20 more years. Um, and, you know, I, that always, uh, that haunted me for a long time, you know, this, 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 uh, adopted sister and daughter who had been left behind. And I think for those of us who've been refugees and lived through these kinds of war experiences, I think a common theme is what might've happened. I think we all know people who were left behind or who died or it was some horrible experience. And if we were lucky enough to serve, to not have those things happen to us, I think for many of us, it's probably a common idea in the back of our minds that could have been me. Yeah. And so I think a lot about that uh, with my adopted sister. And I did meet her once when I went back um, for me about uh, nearly, uh, nearly 30 years after I'd left. And I think that she appears briefly in the memoir. And uh, the reason why the appearance is brief is because I don't know her that well, you know, and that's also a painful element aspect of our refugee histories is oftentimes families are fractured and there's nothing sometimes there's nothing sentimental about family relationships just because you have a relationship with someone officially doesn't mean you're you're going to have an emotional relationship with them and that's painful uh to think about that so that's why i didn't write about it that much because in order for me to write about it even more i'd have to go to vietnam again go to my hometown which i've never been back to because my father said you can never go back to ban Mitui. Now it's called Bun Matua. And my, my adopted sister lives there with her family. So uh, the, if there was another memoir, it would be about that return to Vietnam, that return to the to my actual origins in that actual town, and the meaning of these devastated uh, relationships that are uh, the way that history shattered my family. 
That brings me to um, this point that I think about when you write about uh, your mother in, in the memoir and this idea of fractures um, can come from physical, geographic, being apart from each other. But there's also us growing up alongside these people, but the language doesn't connect us. I can't imagine you with your full language capacity in English and your mother's language capacity or your father's language capacity, that these two, two ways of seeing the world in Vietnamese and in English, uh, parents and, and, and son inside your household was able to fully exchange thoughts and ideas and your mother's passed away. And how does that make you feel about really knowing your, your mother or your adopted sister or, um, is that something that we just kind of live with because we are a product of, of being refugees? Again, another painful emotional topic. Uh, and I think that, I don't know if that's something that we have to live with. I think that's just a reality for a lot of us, you know, that the, our ability to be fully in communication with people in our families, our relatives, people close to us is sometimes you know, deeply limited by these language issues but also by just a separation of, of of personal experience like what our parents went through has been is so different than what so many of us went through um so how can we communicate even across that cultural uh and generational divide so it is a, a painful um painful topic uh i i you know i i struggle with it a lot especially as i think about how my relationship with my own children if we ever have these kinds of fractures, it won't be because of language. It will be because of other things, but we share the common tongue of English. And so there's tremendous pleasure for me to be able to have conversations with my kids that are really, you know, as rich as they can be with a 10-year-old and, and a four-year-old that I never had with my parents. Um, again, I, I, I take that as an example of how history has damaged us and shaped us. And so when I write a memoir, I write about what that means, what these experiences mean for me individually with my family. But also what's important for me is to talk about the history that, you know, I don't think what you described is uncommon. It resonates with me. It makes me think that there are many of us who share these experiences. And there's comfort to be had in that. As painful as it might be for ourselves individually with whoever we can't communicate with, the fact that we share this experience with many others means, number one, we're not weird. And number two, it's history. It's not necessarily our own failures that have led to this point. But the fact that the factors out of our control have shaped us, that gives me a sense of, of empowerment because then I think I have, I have some understanding of the way that I am, that it's not just me, but it's all of us or many of us in this generation who have been affected by the consequences of the war. You are traveling a lot um, to 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 work on your book tour and and being away from your family and your kids and you know every day that I am with my children is a a very valuable uh, and I fight for these days to and I know it's short and and they grow up fast, um, but there is a separation a physical separation that you experience as somebody who is traveling to 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 do work on the book tour. Um, does it pain you or do, do you think that it's like a it's it's part of you know it's it's a luxury that you're willing to kind of uh go through because you know you your parents weren't afforded that same sort of luxury with you and you know you have a different sort of lifestyle um because when i'm away from from my kids i, I always think about people like you who are traveling so much to be uh actually pounding the pavement to to push the work that you do and and i and i also often wonder um how you feel about being away from your children physically and your wife and your partner and everybody you know i i when i first went on book tour back in 2015 it was all very exciting and it remained exciting for a couple of years and all that and then um and that, by that time i had my my son ellison already uh now many years later i'm I'm a jaded veteran of the book tour <laughs> it's like a, it's a, it's a chore now to do yeah. i mean i love i love meeting readers i love that yeah. interaction but being on the road being away from home gaining 10 to 15 pounds every time i've been on the road for a month and all, all and being away from the kids all that is is wearing 
And certainly this last book tour, I, I was I was quite lonely, you know, in addition to missing my kids, it was compounded by all the political stuff that was going on that we talked about earlier. And so, yes, it is hard to be away from the children. Uh, it is hard to be away from Lan and the family and the house that we built together, the home that we built together. Um, and the difference, I think, for me, when I look back upon my childhood and, and the fact that uh, my parents were always there, they never, hardly ever went away on a trip. Yeah. Yet, you know, it was still a very alienating household for me. Not that, not because they didn't love me, but because they were always working. So even though they never left the city, I mean, they were always gone because they were always at the Saigon Mai at this at this grocery store. So yes, I'm gone for a certain number of days every year physically, but when I come back, you know, I spend time with my with my children. So I think there is something about quality time that matters. I mean, if you spend every single hour or every day with your kids, but you're an abusive father, that's actually that's actually sort of worse than being there for for like. 50% of the days, but making those days count. Um, that's the difference, I think. And so I try to gauge how, despite, however I feel in terms of missing my kids, I try to gauge my my absence on them by by seeing whether they're functioning, lovely people who want to yeah. talk to me and, and want to spend time with me. They So far, so good. You know? So that helps to compensate for, uh, for missing them. So my final question is, uh, every therapist uh, has a therapist and every... Uh, writers have people who read their work and, 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 and give them critique. And who are the people that give Viet Thanh Nguyen notes and <laughs> spiritual advice and, and mentorship? Well, I mean, Lan, my partner, Lan Yung, uh, professor and poet was always the first reader. I mean, she's read most of my things from the beginning. Um, she was, you know, valuable, in, invaluable in reading uh, a man of two faces near the end. And then, you know, I I have a, a set of writerly friends and colleagues and scholarly friends and colleagues, activist friends and colleagues who I trust. You know, I think we work in the same universe of, of assumptions about writing and power and colonialism and racism and war and all that, all that kind of thing. Um, and so, you know, when I wrote A Man of Two Faces, there was a moment where I finished a draft and I did a workshop and invited, you know, these writers um, to critique the manuscript and that wasn't an easy experience when i say they really critiqued it you know and and uh but the book and myself as a writer came out better for that experience so you know i think that's that's an important big point to make is that to have people in your corner that you trust doesn't mean that they're just gonna you know su support you in in a sense of saying everything you're doing is right you're awesome i mean you want to you want them to hold you accountable in, in whatever endeavor you, you you want their support and so that's what i get from my writerly friends and colleagues is generous criticism. And I think that's all, that's, that's, that's a lovely gift to give to somebody. Yeah. Thank you for opening up today. Um, you know, the, the part about you traveling and, and feeling lonely, especially when you were going through all of the, um, the 92 Y stuff and, and just being on the road, uh, things that, you know, we as readers and, and audience people are not thinking about, you know, there's a human behind, the creation of these products. So thank you for opening up and sharing with me today. Thanks, Ken. I'm very human. <laughs> so, thanks for bringing that out. Thanks, Viet. Thank you for listening to The Vietnamese with Kenneth Nguyen. Special thanks to Brittany Tran, to Jane Nguyen, Catherine Nguyen, Tina Pham, Sydney Jamie, and Christo Trin. Please find us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at The Vietnamese Podcast.